himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. This is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. We're going to take a fresh look at Jesus tonight, and uh, I want to introduce my friend Jeff Querfeld to you. Uh, Jeff is a great teacher of the word, and he's agreed to come alongside. And so I want you to give Jeff a warm welcome tonight. He's going to introduce himself and get us rolling. Thank you, Jeff. Bless you. Just a quick introduction of who I am. I am what they call an MK. Um, maybe you've heard of PK. I'm an MK. I'm a missionary kid. I was born in Costa Rica, Central America. My parents served on the mission field for over 40 years. I was born in Costa Rica, and my parents were church planting. They moved to Nicaragua. We lived there for a while, 1979, if you know your history. We kind of got kicked out of Nicaragua, thanks to the good old US of A. We were actually evacuated from Nicaragua because of the war, 1979. Went to live in Honduras for a little while, went back to live under communist Nicaragua for one year, and then went back to Costa Rica. So that's, that's been my life, uh, very interesting. After that, college, I came to the United States. Um, after college, I taught at a Christian school for about eight years. And then for four years, I helped start a Christian school down in Queens. We went from zero to 120 students in about four years. And now I'm at a public school teaching history right here in Port Chester, and I've been there for nine years. So if anybody wants to stretch or raise your hand, watch out because I'm calling on you, okay? So be careful. <laughs> um, let me begin. 1512, in 1512, Michelangelo finally finished his masterpiece. After four years of being on his back, he finished his masterpiece on the Sistine Chapel. Unbelievable, unbelievable work of art. But throughout time, with all the candles in the Sistine Chapel, the soot from the candles, and then when industrialization with cars and motorcycles and Vespas, if you know anything about Italy, it, people started to question the colors that Michelangelo used. And as you can see there, it just became dull. And people said, what, this guy, you chose those colors? Until the 1980s, they started a 14-year process. It took them four years to paint. 14-year process to basically clean it up. A uh, um, fresh look for me is that. We get a, a lot of us, some of us, maybe we've grown up in Sunday school, grown up in the church since we were three years old or, or since the beginning, or there's some of us who are brand new. Fresh look, and especially tonight with Jesus, I want you to just to keep an open mind and look at Jesus maybe in a different way, maybe something you hadn't thought of before. Um, so this is Fresh Look, and we're going to start with John 1. And I'm going to use John 1 as basically a springboard, and I'm going to talk about who is Jesus, and then Pastor Glenn is going to talk about why Jesus came. So look at, let's look at John 1.1. 1, 1. I think it's there in your notes. In the beginning, let me just stop there. This in the beginning is before the Genesis 1, 1 in the beginning, right? This is in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Here the Word is Jesus. And what is the first thing it says this? And the Word was God. So who is Jesus? Unequivocally, there's no question about this. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Not he's kind of like God. No, he's God. Um, and really, this question is actually um, debated. In the Bible, Jesus is God. And let's just look at some um, things that we can see, some different proof that Jesus is God. Um, first of all, 
as we can see in John 1, it says that the word was God. And then we see in Hebrews 1.8 that Jesus is called God by God the Father. Hebrews 1.8, it says, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. So God is saying to Jesus, what? Your throne, O God. So even God the Father is calling Jesus God. If we keep looking, Jesus said that he was God. Jesus claimed to be God in that he was before Abraham. Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I am. Let's go back to Exodus 3. Remember when God shown himself to uh, Moses in the burning bush? And God said, Moses, did I say Abraham? I didn't say Abraham. Did I? Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. Moses said, oh, um, okay. I want you to go back to the Israelites. I want you to take them out of Egypt. And then Moses asked God, God, when the Israelites ask me who sent me, what do I say? And God said, just tell them I am who I am. And there's that Yahweh that is that holy Yahweh. Um, and here Jesus in the New Testament is basically saying what? I am, which is I am God. If we keep looking, Jesus also claimed to be one with the Father. In John 10, 30, it says, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. In this verse, the, is, the Jews at this time, when Jesus said that, they knew exactly what he was saying. Because what was the reaction of the Jews in this time when he said that? They wanted to basically stone him and kill him. God, Jesus said he was God. And then if we keep looking, in Isaiah, even prophecy said that Jesus is God. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus in his time, he forgave sins. Only God can forgive sins. He is the creator, as we saw last week. Jesus is God. Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Jesus is God. Now, if we go back to John 1, 1 the word says, the word, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. That first phrase, the word became flesh. Okay, so who is Jesus? Jesus is God. And now Jesus is God made flesh, God incarnate. Wait a second. Is it 50-50? Jesus, it was when he came to earth, he was 50% Jesus, was 50% human, 50% God? No. Okay, here's the problem now. He was 100% God, 100% man. Now, that's a tough one to let sink in great verse philippians 2 6 and 7 who being in very nature god did not consider equality with god something to be used to his own advantage rather he made himself nothing or in some translation emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness so jesus is one 100% God, 100% man. But if there's going to be a merger between being divine and being human, I think the divine side really has to limit itself. There has to be certain limitations, right? When it comes to limitations, when we're talking about knowledge, power, time, space, Jesus was completely God, but yet human. I almost think of it this, this way. You've seen those Staples commercial, that easy button. 
I think Jesus had an easy button, a God button that he never pressed. Um, Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. He refused to basically use this button because it would really end the whole idea of, lim of living here as a human being. Uh, the, the, the verse, the, the, the story that really brings this home to me is the one in Mark 4, where he is preaching to the multitudes in the boat. And after preaching and talking to the multitudes, they're going to cross the sea. And as they're crossing the sea, he falls asleep. He's tired. There is a storm. The disciples wake him up. Jesus, don't you care that we're dying? Or in the 2013 translation, hello? Don't you see that? So there's a problem here? <laughs> and and what, does, what is Jesus' reaction? Jesus' reaction is, hush, be still. And, and then the, the verse says, and the sea was perfectly still. Jesus being tired, but yet, hush, be still, and even the winds obeyed him, and the disciples go. And really, this is Mark 4. Even the disciples are really questioning this whole idea is, is Jesus God? Because what's their reaction? Who is this that even the wind obey him? And if I go a little further on, in the story where Jesus is walking on water, after that whole event, the disciples go, he truly must be the son of God. I think it was starting to sink in that, that Jesus is God. Um, let's keep, we'll keep going. Um, now, divinity, one thing I, I want to say, divinity is not something Jesus acquired after in life. It, it wasn't divinity after the resurrection or after the death. No, Jesus was divine from the beginning. It didn't come later on. It was from the beginning. Now, the other question I've heard is, but, but wait a second. He didn't sin. Isn't it human to sin? Well, I, I thought about that, and, and then I said, no, you know what? Sinning is a characteristic of a fallen human, not the way God intended to. So, so therefore, Jesus lived here on earth and lived without sin. Now, let's talk about how was he as a man? How was Jesus? What was Jesus like? I don't know if you've ever thought of that. You know, sometimes we think, you know, the, the, the Sunday school lessons, but what was really Jesus like? The first thing that I thought about, Jesus is approachable. Wait, and this is, this is radical, especially for the time when Jesus was here on earth. This is radical. A God being approachable? In those times, you know, the, the, the holy people, really, they, they were kept at a distance. And here comes Jew, Jesus, approachable. He had no supernatural glow. He had no halo. And, and even if you look, John the Baptist really didn't recognize Jesus, uh, but he had that special revelation. But there was, he, he almost would have missed Jesus if it wasn't for that. So Jesus is approachable. The other thing, when it comes to that, he let himself get distracted by any nobody. If you think throughout the scriptures, he, his response to, to suffering people was one of acceptance. He took time for the unclean, the sick, the unaccepted. And, and his response to the way he reacted to his people just gives us a glimpse of who God is, the heart of God. I think he would have issues with our to-do list in our structured society. You know, we have, we have to do this, this, this. When you look at Jesus, he didn't have that mechanical and all that to-do list. You know, I even think two of his, okay, better known miracles of, of raising people from the dead Jairus' daughter and Lazarus, both of them, he did it because he got there too late. So Jesus was, was approachable. Jesus was 
distracted by any nobody, and people were drawn to him. People were completely drawn to him. He had a very diverse list of friends. You know, we go from rich people to Roman centurions to the hated tax collectors to leprosy victims, right, who are usually out somewhere else. People like being with him. Where he was, joy was. Jesus showed emotion. He showed sympathy. He showed grief. So Jesus was human. Jesus was approachable. Jesus is God. Jesus, and I know this is something that really hits me, he's a master teacher. He is a skilled communicator. If, if people sat for three days without eating to listen to him, I have problems 40 minutes in my classroom. <laughs> so he was a very skilled communicator. Um, he used the parables, the object lessons, and he was telling profound truths using everyday stories. And, you know, we all love to hear stories. And, and Jesus served, these parables served Jesus' purpose perfectly. And even in this society where a lot of people were, were farmers, were fishermen, he held their attention, and they learned these profound truths. You know, the, the parables are so much easier to remember. It is one thing, one thing to talk in abstract terms about the infinite, boundless love of God. But it's quite another to tell of a man who lays down his life for his friends. Or a heartsick father who scans the horizon for some sign of his wayward son. Big difference. Jesus also used teachable moments. As teachers, we thrive on those teachable moments. We thrive when that student who has said nothing the whole year actually raises his hand, and this time it's not to go to the bathroom, and he raises his hand and actually asks a question, but it doesn't really have to do with the topic. But it doesn't matter. We use that little interest that we see and we make a lesson out of it. We use these little teachable moments. Jesus used every teachable moment he had. He gave us most, some of his most enduring lessons right on the spot in spontaneous response to questions. Is it lawful to pay pagan authorities? What must, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How can a man be born when he is old? Jesus took every single one of these opportunities to basically tell of his mission here on earth. Even when soldiers went to seize him, they returned empty-handed and said, never did a man speak the way this man does. John 7, 46. So what did he say? I want to go back to John 1, 1 14. And use the end of that verse. The word became flesh, okay, Jesus is God, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth, to me, is also a good summary of his message. His message was a message of grace and truth. His message of grace and as a little kid, I remembered learning that grace is God's redemption at Christ's expense. That G-R-A-C-E. It is that whole idea of God's unmerited love. This message, once again, is radical for the time. This message was in total contrast to those who tried to complicate faith with legalism. If you look at the Gospels, the most scathing words that come out of Jesus' mouth are those against the pious, against those who are trying to make it legalism. That's what he had a problem with. Not everybody else. He turned upside down the wisdom of the day. Jesus changed the emphasis from God's holiness to God's mercy. Instead of no desirables, sorry, 
instead of no undesirables allowed, he proclaimed, in God's kingdom, there are no undesirables. This is why sinners felt so comfortable around him, and yet the pious felt so uncomfortable around him. The religious leaders believed that touching an unclean person polluted the one who touched them. But when Jesus touched the person with leprosy, Jesus did not become unclean, the leper became clean. When an immoral woman washed Jesus' feet, she went away forgiven and transformed. He forgave the adulteress. He forgave a disciple who denied ever knowing him. He denied a thief on the cross. Uh, he, he forgave a thief on the cross also. Grace, his message of grace is for the desperate. It's for the needy. It's for the broken. Those who cannot make it on their own. Grace is for all of us. Before God, we all stand on level ground. Murderers, thieves, coveters, we're on level ground. We're all desperate having fallen from the absolute ideal that he had for us. We have nowhere to land, but in his net of grace. It's the only place. And as I was, this morning as I was going to work, um, I was listening to a song in Caleb, and it was, his grace is enough. And that's what it is. His grace is enough. Also, his message of truth. Jesus also preached a message of truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Despite his emphasis on grace, Jesus spoke the truth without compromise. He brought in murder to include anger, adultery to include lust, and theft to include coveting. He never, ever lowered God's ideal. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He also gave us a fair warning to those of us who would follow him. Deny yourself. Count the cost. In Luke 14, 28. The next question is, how did Jesus describe himself? How did he describe his inner man? The only verse I can find is the one Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, I am gentle and humble in heart. These are the two words he chooses to describe his inner man. I am gentle and humble in heart. At first glance, you say, come on, those are the two words? And then I looked at the definition of gentle. And gentle was strength, is strength under control. Isn't that what Jesus did when he emptied himself and came? It's like a wild stallion that has been tamed. He's also humble, reliant on God, not self-reliant. And these are the two words he chose. What does that tell me? Jesus came to serve. The king of kings came to earth to serve. If he did that, kind of should give us an idea of what we should be doing. Lastly, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. I, 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 in my mind, I see the Old Testament as a big neon sign, the biggest neon sign you can see with all the lights flashing, and it's a big neon sign that has an arrow pointing to Jesus. If you look at the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament is pointing to what? It's pointing to him. Jesus is our high priest. He's our high priest, and even more than that, he is a high priest who has really gone through everything we have. He has been tempted just as we have been tempted, and that's why he can come and rescue us. Isn't it true in life when we have our problems? Don't we like to talk to people that have gone through the same thing we have? It just means so much more. When we talk to people that haven't gone through the same thing we have, you understand it, you hear it, but in your back of your mind, I don't know if you're me, but this is me, but they really don't know what I'm going through. Jesus does. Jesus does. 
He is our high priest. He is our manna. He is our bread of life. He is the brass serpent lifted in the wilderness that gives salvation. John 3.14. Jesus is the unblemished Passover lamb that was sacrificed in place of the firstborn. Jesus is. Jesus is. Just leave that. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much. All right, picking up from Jeff, let's think for a minute, why did Jesus come to earth? Three reasons I find the Bible talks about. Uh, Jesus came to earth first to show us what God is like. John said, no man has seen God at any time, but Jesus, the one and only, has made God known to us. And that was just what Jeff was describing to us. All those attributes and qualities we see about Jesus, they are the qualities of God. Second reason I find is that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Those are Jesus' own words in Matthew 20, 28. And finally, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. John wrote, for this reason was did the Son of God appear to destroy the work of the devil? So I, I want to think specifically about the cross for a few minutes this evening. And I want to think about this question. How does the cross of Jesus Christ translate into my personal salvation? We talked on Sunday morning about how we're all dirty. We're all born dirty. We've all been touched by dirty people. We've all done dirty things. Paul said everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's righteousness. So think about this with me for a minute. Here I am over here all dirty. And here is Jesus, sinless, perfect, spotless Jesus dying on a cross over here. But how does his death on the cross Help a guilty man like me. I want to talk very quickly about eight salvation terms with you. How does the death of a sinless, perfect man help a guilty man like me? First of all, Jesus' death was a substitutionary sacrifice. His death was a substitutionary sacrifice. Sometimes you might hear us use the word vicarious. That means that Jesus didn't die even in the smallest part for his own guilt, but completely and only for our guilt. One of the thieves on the cross made fun of Jesus. He said, save yourself, Messiah. But the other thief said, we're getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus' death was totally substitutionary. He died in our place. He bore the full penalty that was due us. And Jesus' sacrifice satisfies the wrath of God. You see, God's justice requires a penalty for sin. Paul said the penalty for sin is death, not just the end of our life here on earth, but punishment of eternal separation from God. All of humanity is in imminent danger of God's wrath. Paul said that by our very nature, we were born objects of God's wrath. Jesus said in John chapter 3, the world already stands condemned. Let's get something straight this evening. When we teach what's in the Bible, when we proclaim the truth that's in the Bible, we're not judging people. Jesus said people are already under God's judgment. Speaking the truth of God's word presents already condemned people with the only possibility of divine rescue. John 3.36, Jesus says if anyone refuses to believe on Jesus, God's wrath remains on him. Humanity is already under God's wrath, but Jesus' sacrifice appeases God's wrath. 
Paul said in Romans 3.25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. His sacrifice satisfies the demands of God's righteous justice. His sacrifice is the only one that ever could. The blood of animals was never payment enough for the sins of men. Only the blood of the sinless man could make payment for the sins of men. Jesus' sacrifice covers our sins and removes them from God's sight. In Isaiah 1, God says, come, let us reason together. Let's sit down. Let's talk. Let's negotiate. What shall we do about your bloody sin stains? I want them out of my sight. And then God has the answer how we're going to get them out of his sight. He says, I will wash you whiter than snow. The blood of Jesus removes our sin from God's sight so that he can't see them anymore. In David's prayer for cleansing in Psalm 51, he said, hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquity. He said in another place, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. You know, if you travel north over the North Pole, if you go over the top of the earth, you'll start traveling south again. But if you get on a plane and you start flying east, you can keep flying east and you'll never stop flying east. Or you can fly west and you'll never stop flying west. That's how far God has removed our sins from us. Isaiah said, you've put all my sins behind your back. Micah said, you tread our sins underfoot and you hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. How does the death of a, a sinless man help a guilty man like me? His death was substitutionary. Second, Jesus' death redeems. Redemption means to purchase someone's freedom from slavery. On Sunday, we talked about the fact that we're all born dirty. We're all born with a sin nature from our first parents. We're all born with an inescapable and irresistible inner compulsion to sin. We're incapable of not sinning. It's one of the penalties of Adam's disobedience. And then we're all born with a predisposition to certain sins from our birth parents. But Jesus paid the ransom price to purchase our freedom from slavery to sin. Hebrews 9.15 says Jesus died as a ransom to set us free from our sin nature. Titus 2.14 says that Jesus has affected a change in our nature. He redeemed us, Paul says, from our lawless nature and he purified us so that now we have become people eager to do what's good. Peter said Christ has redeemed us from the empty way of life handed down to us from our fathers. By purchasing, by purchasing our freedom from the sin nature, Jesus delivers us from the dominion of Satan. Beloved, Satan can only hold us captive so long as we are sinners. Paul said, don't you know that you are slaves to whomever you obey? So once our sins have been forgiven, once we're set free, delivered from that sin nature, Satan can't detain us any longer. He has no more grounds to hold us. He must release us and let us go. So we are removed from under his power and we are placed under the power and the protection of King Jesus. How does the death of a sinless man help a guilty man like me? Third, Jesus' death makes reconciliation possible. Jesus' death makes reconciliation with God possible. Paul said God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Reconciliation is the removal of barriers in a relationship. It's the removal of walls in a relationship. In order for reconciliation to occur, the offended party has to take the initiative forgive, to forgive. If I offend my wife, I can apologize to her. I can buy her chocolates. I can come home with bouquets of flowers. But she has to choose to forgive. 
Because Jesus' death satisfied God's justice, it cleared the way for God to forgive us and to take the initiative to restore our broken relationship. The most beautiful picture of this is the veil in the temple that was torn in two the very moment that Jesus cried out, it is finished. Think about this. As soon, as soon as Jesus had paid in full the penalty for sin, the barrier between a holy God and sinful men was instantly removed. It's now possible for me to experience God. It's now possible for me to communicate with him, to be heard by him and to hear from him. It's now possible for me to have a relationship with him the way Adam did in the very beginning. What we're discussing tonight is the Christian doctrine of atonement. Someone described it this way, at one mint. God and I are at one once again because of Jesus. How does the death of a sinless man uh, help a guilty man like me. Number four, Jesus' death makes regeneration possible. Jesus' death makes regeneration possible. Regeneration is the entrance of eternal life into me. Jesus called it being born again. Life from above comes into my human being. A creative act of God takes place inside of me and my inner nature is changed. Paul said he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration is what Paul described as becoming new creations. Peter said we have been born into a living hope. Regeneration is newness of life that we receive from God. How does the death of a sinless man help a guilty man like me? Number five, Jesus' death makes justification possible. Jesus' death makes justification possible. Justification means an acquittal. Regeneration is a change of my nature, but justification is a change of my standing before God. Justification is God's verdict that I am not guilty, that I am penalty free, that I am fully righteous. Someone described justified this way, it's just as if I'd never sin. And it's true. Paul said we've been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Beloved, listen to me. Some of us need to be helped by the Holy Spirit, even those of us who are believers and who have walked with the Lord for some years. You know, we don't always, the, accurate, the picture that we see of ourselves is not always an accurate picture. We still see ourselves as sinners when God looks at us because of our faith in Jesus. He looks at us and it's just as if I'd never sinned. How does the death of a sinless man help a guilty man like me? Number six, Jesus' death makes imputation possible. Imputation, that's a fancy theological word. I'll explain it to you. <laughs> imputation is God's work of crediting Jesus' own righteousness to my account. Several years ago, we got a call from Western Canada when Denise was in high school, she lost her mom to cancer. Denise's aunt and uncles were selling the family farm in Alberta, and they decided to give Denise her mom's share of the proceeds. So they called asking for banking information so that they could wire funds to us. And sure enough, a little while later, the money showed up in our account. We had done nothing to earn that money. We had done nothing to deserve it. We were not owed that money. That money wasn't ours, but it became ours. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> How many of you know that's a good phone call? <laughs> but listen to me, beloved. That's what God does for us. God doesn't only forgive us. 
God doesn't only transform our nature inside. He doesn't only acquit us, but he actually transfers Jesus' own righteousness to us. Paul said in Romans 4, 24, God will credit righteousness to those who believe in Jesus. That's what Paul says in Philippians 3, those famous words when he says, May I be found at that final day, at that final hour, when God calls me home, may I be found possessing a righteousness that is not of my own through good works. But may I be found in that moment when I go home possessing the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' own righteousness becomes our righteousness so that we can stand before God. How does the death of a sinless man help a guilty man like me? Number seven, Jesus' death makes adoption possible. Adoption is God's work of receiving me into his family. Paul said God has given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Dear Father, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit, reminds our spirit, encourages our spirit that we are the children of God and if children, then heirs of God. Adoption is a state of intimate relationship with God. A few weeks ago, we were all stuffed in here for the community Easter egg hunt. We had over 800 people here in the sanctuary. It was a zoo. And all of a sudden, while I'm making my way through the crowd, I felt something on my leg. So I looked down, and there was a little toddler clinging to my pants. <laughs> and at the same moment I looked down at him, he looked up at me. And when he realized that I wasn't his father, his lips started doing the... <sighs> The quivering, the quivering thing. <laughs> and he was about to burst into tears when all of a sudden he spied his father. And just like that, he let go of me and he, rabbed, uh, he, he ran and he grabbed onto his father's pant leg. You know, it was inappropriate for him to hang on to me like that because I'm not his dad. But adoption means that I get to cling to God's pant leg. It, it means I get to cling to him for comfort. It means I get to cling to him when I need help. It means I get to cling to him when I'm overwhelmed. Whenever I feel very small in a very big world, I get to cling to him just whenever I need a hug. Adoption means that I'm never again alone in this world. It's the inner assurance from the Holy Spirit that God is always with me, that God is always protecting me, that God is always providing for me, that he'll always come through and take care of me. And adoption is a promise of a valuable inheritance. We are fully sons now, but we're not fully mature now. There's an inheritance waiting for us on the other side of our lives when our earthly bodies are finally transformed into glorified heavenly bodies and we receive everything that God has in store for us. And adoption tells me that I am guaranteed that inheritance, it's coming. How does the death of a sinless man help a guilty man like me finally Jesus' death makes perseverance possible. Jesus' death makes perseverance possible. Perseverance is God's ongoing salvation work inside of me throughout this life. Paul said, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it all the way to completion. Everybody look at me. What that verse does not say is that he'll just keep working on it. The verse says he'll complete it. He'll bring it all the way through to completion. Perseverance is Jesus holding us in his strong grip throughout our entire life on earth. It's his ongoing perfecting work inside of me. It's the life of Christ continually flowing through me, the life of the vine flowing into me, the branch, so that I bear the fruit of Christ's likeness in my life. How does the death of a sinless man help a guilty man like me? 
Now, I want to talk just very quickly before we go to our groups. How do we move all of these wonderful benefits of the cross from possibilities to realities in our life? Jesus' death was a substitutionary sacrifice. It satisfied God. It is effective enough to cover the sins of the whole world. But that doesn't mean that all of this wonderful salvation automatically becomes mine and yours. His sacrificial death creates the possibility for redemption and for reconciliation and regeneration and justification and imputation and adoption and perseverance. But none of these things become personally mine until I receive them. And the way I receive them, the Bible says over and over and over again in every verse and every line is through faith. Saving faith is expressed in repentance towards sin. It's that divine moment when the Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin. When I become aware of the fact that I am in imminent danger of God's wrath and I become convinced of my need for him. Jesus called this moment poverty of spirit. It's a moment of spiritual humility. Emotionally, we feel genuinely sorry for our sins, but more importantly, with our will, we make a decision to turn away from our life of sin. You know, we often think about how repentance affects our emotions, feeling a deep sense of remorse and sorrow, but the most important part of repentance is how it affects our will. Jeff talked about the prodigal son, when the prodigal son had that moment in the bottom of the pig pen, when he had a change of mind and a change of heart, he said, I will get up and go back to my father. That's repentance. It's saving faith expressed in turning away from a life of sin and saving faith expressed in turning toward God. It is trust in God. Saving faith is the decision to surrender my entire life to God. It's my decision to yield to Him completely, to obey Him completely. It's the decision to depend upon Him only. Can I tell you, I don't know, honestly, what people in the world do without Jesus have a young family that have been friends of our congregation for many, many years. We met them first uh, nine years ago when we were doing a purpose-driven life study here. They were part of our small group, Isabel and Manny. My wife and I had a special little bond with them because uh, we had twins that were two years old and they had twins that were one at the time. Isabel just went home to be with Jesus at 5.30 this morning, leaving Manny and four young children. I honestly don't know how people get through without the Lord. How do people make it through this life without a God that they can run to and cling to the leg of his pants and say, Father, I need you. Pick me up. All of these things that we discussed, they happen instantaneously in our life the moment we believe. In Jesus God has extended to us the offer of this great salvation. And faith is our outstretched hand reaching to accept his invitation. As we turn to our small groups tonight, I want to leave you with this one question about Jesus' substitutionary death. Redemption, reconciliation, regeneration, justification, imputation, adoption, perseverance. I want to simply ask you, are all of these things yet possibilities for you? Or have they become realities for you? God bless you, everyone. I'm going to turn you over to your group leaders now. They have some discussions for you to talk about tonight. Have a great time, and the Lord be with you.